You like jazz? Hi all, I'm Not a Wax Figure, and welcome to Ground Up History. Today I'm going to be teaching you about the history of bees, and I actually mean that truly this time. We're going to be talking about, you know, economic history, modern times, all that good stuff. Uh, it's still going to be bug facts though, if you really like the bug facts and the bug videos, uh, this is going to be the last bee one, but uh, for now, let's move on to the joys of economic history. So for any of you looking to get a history degree, uh, what you're instead going to discover is that instead of history being all about grand characters, or fun facts, there's only two things that are true in our past. You die, and there are goddamn bureaucrats everywhere. Man, you will go into your university, you will spend your first day and think, this is amazing. And then you'll work on your paper, and you're going to find that all your sources are just tax documents, man. None of it has anything of substance to say. So you're going to spend hours writing a paper at the last minute, losing your mind all about how you can't actually construct a real argument because the sources don't have it. It's not there. It doesn't exist. But what you can do is you can say, hey, they, they you know, had this many goats this season. They, they had a nice harvest that year. It's really useful data. That's what matters in the human past. It's the goddamn taxes. And you know what you're going to realize? You're going to have an epiphany moment where you lock in and you realize in a thousand years when my bones are dust and our cities are rubble, there is going to be some grad student who's going to know exactly how many potatoes were grown on a farm in PEI and he'll use that to conclude that we ate potatoes, and that's all that they're gonna have about us. All of that to say, economic history can be a useful insight into the past, so long as you avoid the existential dread. So, staving off those horrors, let's use a little economic history to try and understand the impact bleeds have had. I think the best way to do this is look at the cultural and social impacts of a number of bee-related products, just to see how they may have generally affected us. The, uh, the, the numbers, too. And how could I start with anything other than honey? It's the deliciously sweet, multiply regurgitated byproduct of nectar that we all know and love. Oh, you didn't know that it was multiply regurgitated? Well, don't worry. Unlike with humans, who when we multiply regurgitate on each other, it creates a cascade of nightmares, when bees multiply regurgitate on each other, it creates a deliciously thick syrup full of carbohydrates and vital nutrients. From there, it's stored in a comb where the tiny little bees will fan their cute wings uh, to get all the water evaporated out of the honey. And then once it's thickened enough, they cover it and seal it with wax. And that nice thickened syrup isn't just an excellent treat for early hominids and bears alike, but it's actually been demonstrated to have some antimicrobial properties and may even actually speed up wound recovery. So for those of you who didn't watch the last video, now the time's to go back and check it out because I spent a lot of time in that one ranting about bees and early humanity. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to skip kind of straight into civilization. And actually, when it comes to bees as medicine, there's basically examples of honey as medicine for as long as there's been civilizations. Uh, in India, the Ayurvedic text reference bees for many ailment cures. China thought that honey was so valuable as a medicinal that they actually recommended its daily consumption. And in ancient Greece, uh, Hippocrates, you know that guy that that oath is named after that every medical person has to swear to? Uh, he actually used it so much that it's even included in the godly ambrosia. It's even referenced directly in the Quran. So honey was given a literal divine purpose to help mankind in a lot of these framings. But I think we can sympathize why people living before germ theory would latch on to whatever natural phenomenon actually helps. I mean, yeah, I get it. When we think of medieval medicine, a lot of the time we think of quackery that either made things worse out of sheer ignorance or actively hindered health for profit. And okay, yeah, I've been to the medieval houses in Edinburgh. Medieval people were yucky. But there are lots of examples of genuine attempts that would have actually worked based on what we know now. In the Levant, between the 10th to 18th centuries, there's text detailing how honey was used that would be legitimately effective against various infections or scrapes, burns, hemorrhoids. And okay, sure, if you had all of those things at once, honey's probably not going to help you. But if you had a few of them and honey was actually helping, it'd be like a miracle. And okay, yeah, even those texts take with a grain of salt. I mean, those same ones include stink bugs, beaver testicles, and goose oil. 
but it's something. And I mean, okay, sure, still take your medieval medicine with a heaping helping of salt, for sure. But a little bit of faith with that honey salve might have helped it work just that little bit faster, even if it was just placebo. Of course, nothing sacred can't also be sold. The products that would be sold from bees, of course, are honey and wax. And of course, there'd be the outside support as well for agriculture. Honey was sold on sweetness alone, especially in a time in Europe when the only real source of sweetness was honey, because sugar didn't really arrive in the continent at the same volumes of later centuries. Uh, and beeswax uh, for medieval Europeans was really useful. I mean, there's lots of examples of churches, documentation, sealing letters. It was a super popular substance. We even have some Roman examples where honey would have actually had comparable prices in the market to things like olive oil. So if honey and wax were so profitable, were they mass produced or industrialized? Well, no. And that kind of gets into the difficulties of beekeeping from this period. See, unlike with modern beekeeping, there wasn't really a way to actually extract honey or wax from a beehive without destroying it. And of course, if bees are important to your successful agriculture, you're kind of incentivized not to. So you might be inclined to think that that would have made the product really expensive. And yeah, you would think, but actually honey doesn't really expire, and neither does wax. So because of its reusability, it was able to stay on shelves for a long time. In an age before refrigeration, fresh is first. And if you're going to be keeping a product over a long period of time that might degrade in flavor slowly, you can actually have that product become relatively accessible, if not necessarily the same quality. So throughout much of human history, beekeeping was more of a passive activity. You would have wild bees or sometimes kept bees adjacent to agricultural areas where minimizing intrusive land clearance would allow you to have a secondary luxury product you could then sell in market. And okay, yeah, you would have to destroy that product, but when that product is mostly made by bees, it's not really like other things, like silk, for example, requires a lot of careful management. Coffee, you have to plan out your seasons. Bees do all the work for you. All you gotta do is break into their home and steal all their shit. And I mean, this is medieval Europe, that's bog standard. I mean, just pretend you're a British soldier in a Greek temple and you'll do just fine. So for a lot of this history, while these products were not necessarily accessible to everybody or inexpensive, it's really difficult to estimate prices in the past, they were abundant enough that we do see them a lot. So that was all a little bit Eurocentric. So let's do a hard detour. And in actuality, there's a huge continent just south of Europe that also happens to love honey, Africa. <laughs> All across the continent, there are examples of different peoples utilizing honey and bees in different ways. In West Africa, we've actually found knock pottery with beeswax residue inside of it dated back 3,500 years ago. There are different theories as to why. In some cases, people think it might have been for storage or even actually for beekeeping, uh, which would mean that, that was a practice in place for thousands of years. In you know, certain theories, you may conclude that this is actually evidence of sapient bees capable of working with ceramics, but that's not a theory I'm willing to entertain at this time. If the bee movie is proven to be a documentary, I have to fundamentally change who I am as a person. So, uh, moving on. Uh, in Kenya, there's a tribe of people called the Okik who actually will store their meat inside of honey. And this actually will preserve the wild game for up to three years, which, without refrigeration, think of how useful that would be for a migratory people. And in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, F.A. foragers will climb 30-meter tall trees to get at beehives, where they eat everything, even the larva. And that's a staple food, so they do it regularly. Basically, all across the continent, there are myriad examples of the ways in which bees and honeys have been utilized. And the ways that it impacts agriculture and abundance. So there's really no part of human civilization that hasn't been touched by it. I mean, what's the point of being a civilization if you can't have sweet meat? And that all leads me into my final point, which is also my first one. Bees are truly vital. From the foods that we eat to the curing our ailments or to important cultural features, we've always been intertwined with bees. They're a vital species to us. And while that's always been true, unfortunately, our lifestyles have started to become very destructive for them. In the early 2000s, colony collapse disorders started to be noticed all across North America and Europe. In some cases, 30 to 90% of bees were dying off. 
And we've attributed that to a lot of different things, uh, herbicides and pesticides, habitat loss, invasive new mites or diseases. But the long story short is that all of that comes back to us and how we impact our environments. There have been a lot of positive regulations that have passed. The prevalence of colony collapse disorder is now down to about 23% as of 2015, but it's still a threat. And if you need to put this into economic terms to be able to value bees, in the United States alone, an estimated $15 billion annually in agriculture is entirely dependent on bee pollination. And that's not taking into consideration all of the wild pollinators that we can't really record. So if that all makes you feel a little bit helpless, there are things you can do. If you have a garden, create a wild area that's not overmanaged where the bees can forage native flowers and build their hives. If you don't have a garden, fair enough, uh, there's lots of community gardens or maybe a local conservancy that might have more information about what the bees in your community might need help with. At the very least, don't use herbicides and pesticides that might kill the bees and try not to kill flowering plants that the bees might need for food, even if that plant is a weed. I hope that this goes to show just how vital bees are to us and maybe we think a little bit more about some of the smallest creatures among us. And with that, I'm ending off the video here. Do all the like and subscribe things. Then have a good day. And look, just get off YouTube, go outside, touch grass. You know, do, just, you, you've been scrolling. I know you were, you didn't click on this video. You were scrolling, just, it came up. Just turn off YouTube, just go outside. Find a bee, kiss a bee. Don't, don't kiss a bee. But you know, just touch grass, go out there, just do it.